Okay, I think everyone can hear me well. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to my presentation on the science and research of the Pan Articulator System. If you don't know me, my name is Tom Lee. I am the son of Dr. Robert Lee, who was a biologist before he became a dentist. So he not only developed the concept of biostatic dentistry, but he also developed the Panadent Articulator System. So what is an articulator? I've asked this to the general person, and they usually give me a response of, is that, is that someone that speaks well? So I hope I'm a good articulator for you today. But basically what it is is a chewing simulator. What we're trying to do is simulate the way someone chews, which is a very dynamic three-dimensional movement that includes an opening, lateral, and closing movement. I do apologize if some of these video clips don't play well. I'll let you know when some are available on our website under our videos button. Well, the definition of occlusion is the state of being closed, which is the bite or the act of closure. All concepts of dentistry uh, believe that there should be equal simultaneous bilateral contacts of the teeth. They may or may not look what's going on at the joint. We look at Dr. Terry Tanaka's work on dissect of the mandibular joint specimens. We can see the, the condyle here, we can see the fossa, and we can see eminence. And these are real linear surfaces, yet most articulated systems have very line mechanical guide systems. The act of chewing is a dynamic movement. As a learned reef, people will learn to chew with the teeth they have, even at the expense of their teeth or the joints. My father often said that the cancer of dentistry used to be periodontal disease and caries, but now the cancer of dentistry is worn out teeth and worn out joints. So when you look at the determinants of occlusion, there's the axis of rotation, protrusive pathway, Bennett pathway, condylar position, plane of occlusion, anterior guidance, and posterior anatomy. The top four deal with the joints, and the bottom four deal with the teeth. And of course, condor position being in the middle, deal with both the joints and the teeth. We look at the evolution of occlusion. We see at the top of the chart, Dr. Jarriott and Dr. Snow, which are the first ones that would develop an articulator and a face bow. And there's been many theories come out of occlusion that have all kind of seemed to dwindle down here. They all dwindle down to biologic occlusion with no name on it. So, of course, I put my father's name down there. And, of course, there's been many articulators that have come out of these different philosophies of occlusion. Ranging from the very first articulator from Dr. Jarriott and now getting into digital articulation or virtual articulation. And most people seem to use very simple barn door hinge type articulators or even hand holding models or what we call the wristolator or living articulator or possibly even anatomical articulator. Well, articulators, are they anatomical or are they mathematical? If I superimpose a mandible onto a lower frame of an articulator, I have a hard time trying to understand that this steel ball bearing is supposed to rep anatomically represent this thing that looks sort of like a football. Well, the concept breaks down to a simple geometry, that two points in space define a straight line. It could be infinitely small the distance or infinitely large on the distance. Two, two points in space define a straight line. And that's what we're doing with these two steel ball bearings is two points in space simulating a straight line or the hinge axis of the mandible. Well, so articulators simulate hinge axis movements, not condyle movements per se. People also talk about sagittal and vertical axes that go through the condyle, but they're very difficult to locate. And the hinge axis is the only axis that's constant with both condyles. So to record condylar movements, we need only to track two points a fixed distance apart on the hinge axis, since any movement of the mandible around a vertical or sagittal axis will always move the hinge axis. Well, there's been a concept of inner condylar distance. 
that if you have a small intercondylar distance or medium or large intercondylar distance will affect the approach of the opposing teeth. You can see in this article he's showing the different groove directions based on the different uh, intercondylar distance factor. Here's another article you know, showing it the lines even longer to prove the point that there's different groove directions as of a small, medium, or large intercondylar distance. But this picture is out of perspective for me. I can't believe this author is going to expect me to have an arch form like this and then expect the mandible to bend out right here to this wider intercondylar distance. It seems like if you had a wider intercondylar distance, you'd probably also have a wider arch. Of course, this author is going to prove the point even further by drawing the lines even further, even though we don't function this far. Uh, he's showing the point so you can see it. He even has condyles now in the middle of the head. Well, my father never did trust any research, and so he had to go try everything for himself. The functional range when you move laterally to canine tip to canine tip is approximately 3 millimeters. The distance from the central fossa of your molar to the cusp tip is also approximately 3 millimeters. So that's the functional range. So we've got a small, medium, and large intercondylar distance articulator. Of course, he had a, pro, uh, I mean a compass. And he got a set of models and he ground down the teeth to make a better writing surface. So he put the compass at the small intercondylar distance mark, start at the center of the tooth, and drew lines on each one of the teeth. Move the compass to the medium intercondylar distance. He had to adjust the, the compass for that distance and scribed a second line. And of course, went to large and scribed a third line. So now we can see the working and non working side, the three lines of the effects of intercondylar distance. And you can see here on the non working side that there are a little bit differences, especially as we go back towards the molar. But remember that he ground down these teeth, which made them much wider. So he drew back in the tops of the teeth, and then we'll go ahead and erase the lines that are beyond the, line, the top of the teeth, which is, again, 3.5 millimeters, not any less. And tell me if you can wax the difference between small, medium, and large. It just looks like basically a thick line. And like my father said, you know, when you drive your car down the road, do you want to hug the shoulder or do you want to hug the yellow line? Now let's go down the middle of the road. And so that's why the pan articulator has an average intercondylar distance of a medium size of 110 millimeters. The hinge axis was started by McCollum and his group that they discovered in 1924 and published in 1926. This is one of the problems I see in occlusion is nomenclature. People trying to come up with slightly different terms to basically describe the same thing that there's an axis of rotation without, within the mandible. And without this phenomenon, there'd be no rationale for modern articulator design. The value of the hinge axis in articulators is it makes axis movements valid at various vertical dimensions. You can also change a vertical, occlusal vertical dimension on the articulator and maintain the cast and centric relation. It's also a repeatable reference location. We can use our axipath recorder to locate this hinge axis where we have a head frame and a graft support over the temporomandibular joint. We have a clutch over the teeth with the bar and recording arms that we can move around in different positions, have the patient open and close, and see the stylus arcing and move that until it just kind of pivots in one position or an axis, a hinge axis location. This is a little tricky trick I, I developed for hinge axis location, and I know some people struggle with this, as you get down a little bit closer towards the hinge axis, sometimes it's hard to see which way the lines are arcing, so you know which way to go towards the axis. I got thinking about this a little bit, and if you look on the patient's right side, and if you just looked at opening movement only, the mandible could open all the way around in a clockwise rotation. So that's why I have these arrows in a clockwise rotation. So if you concentrate on just opening movement, even though they do a closing movement, which direction is the stylus moving when the patient opens? If the stylus is moving straight down, you're going to be in front of the axis, which means you need to make a 90 degree right turn towards the axis. And if you look at the chart, it doesn't matter what direction the arrow is going, it's always a 90 degree right hand turn to the axis. 
course, on the patient's left side, it'd be a counterclockwise rotation, and therefore you would move the stylus 90 degree, or 90 degrees to the left of the direction the stylus moves. If you would like this chart, I am going to get this posted on our website, or if you want to email me, I can send you this chart right away. We can also then transfer this hinge axis we lo uh, located and marked on the scan, and then transfer that to the true hinge axis on the articulator. We can also use uh, FACEBO, which uses a statistical average to a hinge axis by using the ears. It's been calculated according to research that the average axis is about 10 to 12 millimeters forward and 6 to, 8 mil 6 to 10 millimeters down from the auditorium meatus. And of course, the research shows of the accuracy of the ear bow that about 75% of the time you're going to be within 5 millimeters of a true hinge axis. This is fairly arbitrary because that means 25% of the time you're going to be on 5 millimeters of a true hinge axis. But they've accepted this as an acceptable range for doing most procedures when minimum to moderate changes in the dentition are required. Of course, there's more concerns when there's uh, extensive uh, changes required in the dentition or if vertical, uh, occlusal vertical dimension needs to be altered. Yet most procedures are done on a small simple disposable articulator uh, where the axis of rotation is wrong. It's down behind the third molar. It's actually in line with the occlusal plane at point C. If you have an axis at point C, it's a pure vertical movement out of the fossa initially. So it's impossible to have interferences on these small disposable articulators where the axis of rotation is in line with the occlusal plane. The problem arises when you place the restoration of the mouth, the axis moves up by point A up here, craning down in backward rotation which means that if you're doing a lot of restorations on these small disposable articulators, I could predict exactly where you're adjusting the teeth 100% of the time. It'd be the mesial inclines of the upper and the distal inclines of the lower. It's where the muddle rule came from, M-U-D-L. This was an extreme axis of rotation discrepancy. So we know we need an articulator that more anatomically represents the axis of the patient. So when we get models in the articulator, those movements will be more valid for us to diagnose. Now I also realize that the mounting plates are always constant to the axis of the articulator, irregardless of where the models end up being mounted with the use of a face bow or the coist bow or even true hinge axis. So I create a little box in the back of the mounting plate to create a secondary receiving port for my little PAL articulator. The well, PAL articulator has the same axis of rotation as the full soft articulator. It has a little built-in support stand. The frames will separate once you open it past 90 degrees. And it also has vertical and horizontal aesthetic alignment guides built into the frame. When you're done, you can simply push a little button here in the bottom of the mounting plate, which will release the PAL articulator. So you can go back to the full-size panted in to do any quality control or final adjustments. The plane of occlusion. Well, we have steep planes of occlusion. We have flat planes of occlusion. We even have revision situations. Remember, the curve of speed, each tooth has its own plane of occlusion. And we want to capture this plane of occlusion so that we can diagnose or possibly change it if we want to. That's usually related to a reference plane, which includes the axis and usually a third point of reference, usually orbitale. Now what's really important here is where the protrusive pathway relates to the cuspal inclines. But the way we want to capture this plane of occlusion is by using a reference plane, and we do that by the use of a face bow. The bite fork captures the occlusal plane, the face bow is your plane of reference. The upper surface of the face bow is your plane of reference. Whatever you make it, that's what the plane of reference is. There used to be a time where they palpate the lower border of the eye, and then they'd come over and put a spot on the nose and use an orbital pointer for this arbitrary axis orbital plane of reference. Then research came out where they measured from nasion to the border of the eye vertically, 
and came out to be approximately 22 to 23 millimeters. And that's where standardized Nasion relators came from. Man. Ours is standardized at 22 millimeters. So it's relating the upper surface of the face about 22 millimeters below Nasion, where the average border of the eye is, creating the axis orbital plane of reference. So when we go to the articulator, we can see the plane of reference which is the upper frame of the articulator with the orbital pointer here or the reference flag and see the plane of occlusion related to that. We can then use the lower model uh, or use that upper cast to mount the lower model with the inner occlusal record. We also have a broad rake occlusal plane analyzer which is an older concept used sometimes with dentures or even natural teeth. It's used for the evaluation of the occlusal plane or curve of speed. As some of you may know, my father was not a big advocate of curve of speed, did not see it a whole lot in natural dentitions, maybe a little bit on the second molars, but it also made it more difficult for him to disclude the teeth with curve of speed. But this is an interesting tool and I thought I'd show it to you real quick. It's based on Monson spherical theory of four inches, so you calibrate a uh, um, compass to four, four inches and you have your cast in here so you go to the lower canine and put the compass on the lower canine and you scribe an arc onto this reference flag. There are little clear overlays that you snap into place on here so you can save these overlays and come back with this case at any time. Then we'll go back to a molar cusp. Put the compass on the molar cusp and we'll scribe another line. And usually the, uh, there'll be two lines that intersect at this point here. And what Monson's spherical theory was is that if you had a four inch radius from this pivot point here, it should just rotate across the curve of speed of the teeth through the condyle and back, and of course, back all the way around the top of the head. We also have a way where we can orientate the upper frame to use the condyle as a position. If you don't have a canine or a molar tooth to reference from, you can use the axis. And in this particular case, all three lines intersect at the same position. They may or may not. Now we can readjust our compass to the center of those crosshairs on the flag and then sweep the compass across the teeth to, to verify or evaluate the curve of speed for these teeth. So, you know, if you're interested and want more information, we have some online or send me an email. Condylar position versus stable condylar position. It just makes pedic sense to put the joint in the socket. Now, if I dislocated my shoulder, I would go to the doctor. He would reduce my arm back into the socket, put me, quote, into centric relation. Does he just send me home at that point? Not usually. He would usually put me onto a splint maybe give me some anti-inflammatories and say try not to use the arm for a few days. He realized that there's probably inflammation in the joint and there might be even a need for some remodeling in the joint. Pacelt showed quite clearly that if CO or MIP does not equal CR that you not only have centric interferences but that you would have lateral interferences 100 percent of the time and that you would chew in a constricted chew motion in a movement. So when you have your cast mounted and you move them into a lateral border movement and you cannot get the facets on the canine to line up because you have an interference, move the articulator to a slight protrusive movement at that point. So it's a lateral medial protrusive movement. Usually you can get the facets of where to line up and the interference will then be gone and it'll help you understand how they develop that wear on the canine. There's been many ways to try to get centric relation. They believe you need to push back on the chin from MIP to get to CR, so there's chin point pressure developed. This is what my father called the nathological handshake. He never said hello or shook your hand. He always came up to you, grabbed your chin, and said, hey, are you still in centric? So he always liked to have a little fun, and I do too. Basically, it all started with compound on a popsicle stick that would create some type of anterior deprogrammer. We have our panabite tray and we use a lower compound jig. And uh, that creates a new fulcrum point here at the incisor 
with nothing touching between the posterior teeth, allowing the mandible to rise around that anterior fulcrum point upward and forward into the fossa. Here's the bite tray, here's the lower compound jig, and the bite registration material. You can do this technique with any type of material or, or, or any kind of a way you want to do it. The concept's the same as have something in the front of the teeth, separating the posterior teeth, giving insurance to the brain that there's nothing going to hit, relax the muscles, and allow the condyles to seep more into the fossa. You can also use this bite record to verify the accuracy of your cast because if they fit very, very well in the mouth, yet the casts don't fit the intercosal record, then maybe you have inaccurate casts. You then use that intercosal record to mount the lower cast, which is your functional mounting. It'll dictate how those lower teeth approach the upper teeth as long as you are within a statistical average of the axis of rotation when you mount your maxillary model. We do have a CPI system, stands for Condout Position Indicator. We also have an inexpensive API axis position indicator system that can be used for tracking condyles during splint therapy to a stable condylar position. So here's the initial mounting with the initial centric relation records they mounted the cast with. We added the graph supports onto the articulator. We can put marking ribbon in here and we pull the little graph support out until the steel ball bearing touches the graph paper, depositing some dye on the graph paper. My father would then put the patient on occlusal split therapy. He'd have him in each week to adjust the splint. Once he adjusted the splint, he would take a new centric relation record. He would take that new centric relation record and put it in between the originally mounted cast. He would then use a different color and mark the graph support with a different color. So here we can see our initial CR remounted the cast should end up very close or on the crosshair, which it is. And after a week of split therapy, we can see the condyle rose upward one millimeter and went forward at least a half a millimeter. So it's going upward and forward to a stable condylar position. So next week when the patient comes back, he would adjust the splint. He would take a new centric record, put that between the originally mounted cast, make another spot which may be slightly higher. And so that would be slightly higher, more upward and forward. And he'd do this until he would not have to adjust the splint for a period of two to three weeks. And of course the spots would remain in the same position for about two or three weeks, verifying a stable, repeatable, comfortable condylar position which can really change your diagnosis from an MIP position like this to a stable condylar position like this. Now you have to figure out how we're going to get the front teeth together, maintain you know, some anatomy of the posterior teeth while maintaining a stable condylar position. Well, is it a slide or a fulcrum? Many people think that when you go from a CR position like this and have the patient bite together, it appears that the lower teeth slide forward into occlusion. I also had, but yet my father um, said that many of these are fulcrums and where the condyle is moving down and backward. I had a doctor say to me, it's impossible that the lower teeth are coming forward and the condyles are going backward because the two are connected. Well, here, here's a slide. This is my daughter, Amber, and here she's sliding down the slide. So she's like a condyle coming down the eminence. And that's true that you can have slide situations where the condyle and the lower teeth are sliding downward forward into full occlusion. This is a fulcrum or, or a teeter-totter effect. On here, and he's a condyle running upward and forward as the lower incisors go down and backward. So as the lower incisors would come up and forward, he would drop down and backward. So that's where you get the effect of the anterior teeth going forward, but the condyle going backward. It's from a teeter-totter effect. So here's some examples. Here we have a stable uh, condylar position, and now we put the cast into MIP, as you can see the wax bite here. And the condyle has actually slid downward and forward along the eminence as we actually pasted the patient's 
Pachusa pathway from the axi path recorder right on the side of the API graph paper. Here's one where the condyle has actually come down the eminence but also has been fulcrumed away from the eminence a little bit. This is part slide, part fulcrum. The distance forward from the vertical line is the amount of slide. The distance vertically down from the pathway is the amount of fulcrum. So if you were to equilibrate this case back into centric, this dot would move backward and the lower teeth would move backward also. Same thing in a slide situation. You, you equilibrate this case and as you move the condyle back to CR, the lower teeth are also going to move backward. And this is very helpful where if you had an edge to edge position on the teeth, you're hoping that you have a slide situation so when you equilibrate, the lower teeth will go back a little bit and you might end up with a little bit of overbite. Yet if you're really back far on the cingulum and you have a slide, when you equilibrate, you might end up on the papillae, which is very dangerous. So you need to know whether you have a slide or a fulcrum before you start equilibrating. Here's actually a fulcrum where the condyle moves down and backward. And as you equilibrate, the condyle is going to move upward and forward, but the teeth will probably stay at the original position or very close to it. That's why many times when you equilibrate, you end up with the teeth anterior teeth in the same position, but it, there's those few times when you equilibrate that the teeth move back on you, and you may have wondered why. Here's an extreme one here where the condyles move straight down four millimeters. Uh, we've even had them longer than that. Our original graph was only five millimeters wide, and then Dr. Roth had some that were over five millimeters, so we had to increase ten millimeters. Many people wonder how this are, are behind the fulcrum, but the disc has its own pterygoid muscle and can and, and fired independently of the other lower pterygoid muscle, which can wedge the thick posterior band of the disc between the eminence and the condyle, forcing the condyle downward so that the patient can gather. This is something my father postulated in 1985. So this is a, a long time ago, almost uh, 30 years ago, that he came up with this concept. Never did get it verified, but uh, we're pretty sure that's what's happening. We do also have condyle positioners that are used for simulating model sur surgery. They're little fossa boxes that you can put in place of the motion analogs. You can see that there's a little line on the screw and there's a little line on the housing. And with the line on the screw and the housing match up, and the screw is flush inside the housing, it's in a centric relationship position. Each rotation of the screw equals one millimeter. So you can do like quarter of a millimeter, half a millimeter, and you can actually measure how, how far you boop the condyle. So here, here it is on the articulator. And there's also little uh, rings here you can take off the shaft so we can do lateral adjustments in millimeters as well. So here it is doing lateral adjustments. We took the collars off and we shifted the maxillary cast or could be shifting the lower cast uh, laterally for simulating model surgery. Here it is in a centric relation position where the housing. So if we screw the back screw forward, it's like simulating an instrument of the mandibles. And of course, if we screw down, that would be like an impaction of the maxilla. And if we did a combination of the two, it'd be kind of like an auto-rotation of the mandible. So we do have the condyle positioners, which are used either for making recapturing splints or used for similar model surgery. Petrusa pathway deals with opening or incising movement. The condyle not only has the ability to rotate within the fossa, but it also has the ability to translate in the fossa. This translation is a downward forward movement the downward movement is a discluding factor. This research shows that if you have a little bit of better, uh, uh, have a flatter eminential angle, over eminential angle, affect the approach, oops, sorry. What do we have? Try to get some. But they left something out of the equation on this. The anterior guidance. In other words, we want to know the discluding factor of the condyle, which you cannot change, 
to override any negative effect on your posterior teeth, but the other discluding factor you can change your anterior guidance. We can get this pathway by using the AxiPath recorder, or we can do a simple protrusive check bite where the patient's biting edge to edge. Then we take that protrusive check bite to the articular where it's now moved the lower frame and the condylar elements downward and forward to an edge to edge position. The analogs are rotated to its highest position so nothing's interfering in the fossa. Then we loosen the screw and let the analog drop down, hitting the axis element in that downward forward position, setting the protrusive angulation for this patient. So we can see how much discluding factor the guidance gives us uh, on the posterior teeth. Of course, if we have a steeper uh, occlusal plane, I expect to see excellent disclusion and opening movement because it's a lot like those little disposable articulators. But in a protrusive pathway, you don't see disclusion because it's so close to the protrusive pathway. If I go to the extreme opposite of a reverse plane of occlusion, I expect to see excellent disclusion in a protrusive pathway, but not very good disclusion in opening movement. So we like to level the plane of occlusion or give a slight plane of occlusion for aesthetic so that we get disclusion in an opening movement which leads to the mesial inclines of the upper teeth as well as disclusion in a protrusive pathway which would be the distal inclines of the upper teeth. Bennett movement deals with lateral or chewing movement. Bennett described this in 1903. He actually had lights on a patient and when they moved laterally he noticed the shadow on the wall moved and so he described the lateral shift of the working side condyle. This is like looking straight down on top of someone's head and as you come forward the condyles move straight forward then you move to a chewing side the working side moves upward outward and backward as the non-working side shifts in and then you go from a border or lateral position back into full occlusion the chewing stroke the working side shifts in, and this is what Bennett described as Bennett shift. So I like to call that Bennett shift. Yeah, people have used Bennett movement, other terms. I like to describe the working side as Bennett shift. Now the non-working side moves upward, outward, and backward on a curved pathway. So I like to call the non-working side Bennett movement. Of course, Bennett movement is an inward movement of the condyles. So if you have a little bit of Bennett movement versus a lot of Bennett movement, this researcher is showing that it affects the approach of the opposing teeth. And it looks like no matter how much Bennett you have, that we need to all start going in and hosing off all these costs that are in the way. But again, they left something out of the equation, the canine guidance. Now this, pretend this is a new restoration back here that you just placed, and there is an interference there back here there's an interference so let's say this is a new restoration you place and you have an interference most people would want to break out their favorite burr and start adjusting that but I tell people let's look at this at a whole system is this canine worn yes it is and if we add it back just a millimeter or so to that we start to get guidance and if we start to get guidance would we then bypass it interference back here. That's why mounting casts and duplicating their movements is so important is so we can diagnose these things and see if it can be done before we go to the mouth. Again if we add too much length to the canine we might end up with a vampire look because this central is slightly shorter than this one. So maybe we need a little bonding on this edge and maybe add back some guidance on the canine. By the way anytime you see wear on the canine it usually starts with the mesial the upper and distal lower. It is the first sign of occlusal disease. Uh, that's where you'll see the wear starting first. It actually goes along with Thielman's Diagonal Law. Thielman's Diagonal Law states that if you have wear on the canine, the problem is contralateral to it, that you'll have an interference contralaterally to that. So start looking for the wear on the canines on these kids. We also have analog selectors, which is a way of measuring Bennett movement uh, with using lateral check bites. This was developed more for students at school or for third world countries that could not afford a hinge access recorder. 
So we can measure bend of movement with our hinge axis recorder. We have it move laterally and then we simulate a hard shoe by pushing at the angle of the mandible to induce the full amount of bend of movement in the joint. The schematic it shows that the recording arm is to the mandible and as the mandible moves inward, downward, forward, so does the arm. As it moves inward, it's hitting the plate which pushes on the stylus, separating the bennet ring here on the side, measuring the amount of bennet movement that occurs at the joint. The history of recording devices. Well, here's the Stuart Panograph, which is an ingenious system. It had vertical and horizontal graphs to it. It had uh, clutches over the teeth with a central bearing screw. And they would put chalk or powder on the plates and have the patient move around and scribe lines onto these plates. They would then take the whole recorder to the articulator, mounting the clutches into the articulator with the recorder. They'd try to start to follow the lines on the graphs until something bound up in the guide system. When it bound up in the guide system, then they would adjust that and custom grind an analog motion specific for that patient. It was a quite ingenious system as the artifact of the clutch would stay with the clutch, but the movements of the condyle would be translated into the back of the machine. Here's the Danar mini recorder where they move the stylus forward from the hinge axis. You know, and why would they do that? Because the further away you move from the source you're recording, the hinge axis, you lose fidelity. What it made it much harder to grind in this very complex curvilinear movement versus adjusting, quote, this straight line bended angle. That's where the bended angle concept came from, was with the these mini recorders recording off the hinge axis. It did not look like a curved pathway, it's just a straight line here. And that's where most guide systems of articulators now have the straight line bended guide. This is the stereograph. It is a true panograph. Two rigid bodies moving relative to each other. It has a little central bearing screw in here. They have these steel studs implanted up here. They put some soft acrylic now in between the plates. Have the patient move their jaw around, molding in Pacelt's rhombus into these recording plates. They would then put those recording plates into the articulator put some soft acrylic up into the fossa box, move this, uh, these two plates around as it would mold a custom analog of motion specific for this patient. You know, it's, it's kind of a shame that Dr. Whiff didn't have a son to continue his business uh, with the TMJ articulator, uh, which is no longer available. Well, it deals with two plane versus three tane plain pantography. Pantography, the condyle moves inward, downward, forward like a helix of a screw in a curvilinear movement. The recordings would record on the vertical and horizontal graph. And this is where Niles Gachet said, hey you guys, look, there's a median right on the horizontal plate. And the problem was is that when you went to at the start plate, as the vertical stop induced immediate side shift into the articulator. And then this point on the vertical plate would race down to point C to catch up to point C as it comes to the point C in the articulator. So it actually induced the articulator when that was not what's actually going on in the joint. It's an artifact from these telescoping styloids. Style here, catch up with the plate, that, and so you can see from the edge of the plate to the stylus has gotten larger as it's a sweeping motion across the plate from the plate moving downward. So it's, it's kind of an artifact from recording outside the center rotation of the condyles and the distance of the stylus to the recording plate. Well, it all comes down to six degrees of freedom, or what I like to call six elements of freedom that there's translations in three planes of space as well as rotations in three planes of space. And so with my father's recorder he added the frontal plane which actually gives you the timing between the vertical and horizontal plates. So here we're recording the condyle that's moving inward, downward, and forward in a curvilinear pathway. The, the styluses are tracing the same movements onto these plates but now we can see that we cannot keep 
this horizontal stylus on the vertical plate at point A as this one shifts over, otherwise we would see immediate side shift in the frontal plate. And we did not see that. So having that timing there forces the condyle and the articulator to reproduce that inward-downward curvilinear movement that the patient had to simulate more lifelike chewing motions on the articulator. My father's research recorder, uh, he did not know what the intercondyle distance was. He standardized the recording tips at 220 millimeters. I do have a little video clip on this. I'm not sure if it's showing up very well for you, but you can also view these online under our videos button. It would be pendant research, jaw movements engraved in solid plastic for articulator controls. I'm just going to let this play for a minute. I know people laugh about the plastic bag over the over the patient's head. By the way, the patient is actually Harry Lundeen. So after he got done recording with these, he could view these clear resin blocks in three planes of space. Here it is in a vertical plane, and over here we have the horizontal plane, and here we have the frontal plane. So even in the horizontal plane, he did not see immediate side shift from centric relation position. There is always an immediate inward downward movement of the condyle on the contralateral side. His secondary panic graph, he he standardized the intercondylar distance at 110 millimeters based on the effects of intercondylar distance. And so it standardized the system. And so as guide pins would guide into the clear resin blocks on the side here that the drills made, vertical mills would come up here and mill out a custom analog of motion specific for this patient. And so let's take a quick look at this video. Right there, right there. So he milled out custom animal motion specific patient. This gives replicator. The replicator had six transducers on it. This was for the six elements or six degrees of freedom. It had paraocclusal clutches on it so patients could actually chew different consistencies of food. These six transducers would send signals to this six channel tape recorder. The six channel tape recorder would then send those signals to a digital reconverter. The digital reconverter would break up the signals into milliseconds and send those signals up to six servo motors. Servo motors have the ability to reverse direction in an instant. So as patients were chewing food over here, their casts were actually chewing food over here at almost the same time. And they didn't even have condyles in here. They were just looking at the chewing patterns, how people chewed. Well, my father went down to see Dr. Lundane and Dr. Gibbs down at the University of Florida. They actually married the two systems together. My father recorded a patient and developed an analog of motion for that patient. Then they mounted the articulator into the Gibbs replicator, and now the actual live patient's movements 
from the replicator are going to move their articulator so that they could see did it follow this, this, the same movements he developed in his guide system, which it did. It followed it exactly. So here we have two different researchers with two different research equipment verifying each other's work. Well, this meets the requirements of scientific method that was standardized, that the primary investigator is able to repeat his results, and other investigators were able to repeat the primary results, and the data was informed that could be analyzed. He did find that, that we're really not all that much different, more alike than we are different. The major differences was the steepness of the protrusive pathway and the curvature of the balancing side Bennett pathway. So here we can see the differences of the protrusive pathway. Some are some flat, others are somewhat steep. Here's the Bennett movement. Some went in just a little bit before it started going, and others went in quick before they started going forward. So there's differences in the Bennett movement as well. They took this information and put it into a computer, which is probably as big as an office, and they came up with statistical averages uh, based on actual patient's job movements. So in the schematic, the protrusive pathway, they all average a three-quarter inch radius, and so we can adjust those by rotating the analogs to get the protrusive pathway. And the Bennett pathway, he developed five different analogs of motion in half millimeter increments, starting from 0 0.5 going to 2.5 millimeters. If we look at the distribution chart, approximately uh, half a, uh, uh, 15 percent of the patients had a half a millimeter, 52 had uh, one millimeter, 21 percent had 1.5, 8 percent had two, and 2 percent had 2.5. That's why we recommend a 1.5 motion analog because that will fit all the smaller sizes. Just like my size 10 foot will fit in a size 11 or 12 shoe, but it may be a little constricted in a size 8 or 9 shoe. So using a 1.5 millimeter analog covers about 80 by 90 percent of the population. So the statistical average is really good there. Of course, here, here's the, the curvature of the Bennett movement here uh, from Gibbs and Lundin's study, and we can see it is a curved pathway on that non-working side, just like the dotted line is shown here. So when we look at the three main types of articulator guides, we have the straight line undercompensated guide system, where here we have the working side shifting out, going straight forward in protrusion, and then moving laterally to the Bennett side. And if you make your restorations fit here, that's fine, but now the patient can actually chew beyond the limitation of the articulator, which means everything between the solid line and the dotted line is a potential posterior interference. So Niles Gachet developed the immediate side shift articulator, went from CR out to side shift and then out to Bennett, but, and he eliminated all possibilities of an interferences. He did that because if you had two millimeters of side shift, it's only three millimeters from the central fossa to your cusp tip of your molar. So if you had two millimeters of immediate side shift, two-thirds of your molar would be as flat as this floor. So this little triangle area in here is anatomy. So from nathology days, they wanted to copy the patient's pathway as closely as possible so that they could reduce or eliminate the possibility of interferences but still maximize anatomy for chewing efficiency and stability. Here's the SAM undercompensated straight line. The patient could probably move just a little beyond that. So there's a potential for an interference using these types of systems. Here's the immediate side shift whip mix. It just shifts straight over and then out to point Bennett. And if anyone's tried to do a wax up on one of these, it's the most difficult thing to work with. And it's overcompensated, which leads to negative errors. And then the compensating Bennett pathway of the panadin system. As you move laterally, the working side shifts out, uh, Bennett shift. The non working side moves inward, downward, and forward, Bennett movement. Going back the other way. That's why when you move the panadin, and it articulates it relates more, more lifelike linear analogs of mode duplicate based on statistical actual movement. So you can see the movement, the, movement and the producer pack and the analogs back, back here and how it simulates a more chilling motion. So we can verify that we now have uh, simultaneous equal bilateral teeth when the joints are in the socket. We can verify an incisal position that we have no posterior interferences 
back into full occlusion. Then we can also look at canine guidance, making sure we have uh, clearance on the working and non-working side and that we have no interferences back into occlusion and going back the other way. So the steepness and tilts of the occlusal plane can all be diagnosed at your superior treatment plan for optimal aesthetics. You have candid occlusal planes, dental midlines, gingival tissues. Hopefully we can get that all straightened out the first time and not have to go back and redo things. Pan articulator can be programmed using average values, using check bites or the axiopath recorder to reproduce the patient's three-dimensional jaw movements for optimum function. You know, taking a, you know, a little hodgepodge of dentistry here, you know, we got the chicken walking in, the chicken walking out here, we got something going on over here. You know, what my father's saying, form follows function. Restore the form so you can restore the function. Restore the anatomy to restore physiology. You know, I question, is it really reconstruction or rehabilitation? These aren't very good words to be using. You know, reconstruction, I do think people reconstruct people maybe to a lesser degree of pathology. And rehabilitation, I mean, that's rehab. Nobody wants to go through rehab. My father often said the most powerful word you can use in your office is rejuvenation. It's not only a renewal of body, but it's a renewal of spirit. So use rejuvenation. I travel a lot. I go into these hotels. They say come down to the spa and get rejuvenated. So here it is, getting rejuvenation. It's not only a renewal of body, but look, it's a renewal of spirit. Look at the eyes brightening up. Of course, this is one of my father's cases, and she was actually suicidal here with the amount of pain she was dealing with and no one able to help her. Uh, with no promises, put her on a splint, got her out of pain, and she's back healthy and happy again. Of course, you know, the poster child of OBI, you know, he said he can't take his money with him, but these he'd like to, you know, see the Almighty. So we see this in my father's cases, but we also see it in his students' cases, and we see it in his students' students' cases. So treatment goals for both function and aesthetics is to eliminate harmful interferences. We, want, of course, want to maximize anatomy for chewing efficiency, stability, and longevity. We want to create a beautiful smile, enhance facial aesthetics. A rationale for our tickets then would be for diagnosis. Uh, do we have any interference? Develop a treatment plan, analyze the anatomy. We need to be able to communicate this with the laboratory. We need it for teaching, didactics. I think most important baseline record. What did you do to them, and how are how are they surviving after that? So some basic fundamental records would be a Facebook registration, which would give you a relationship to an axis of rotation, steepness of the plane of interocclusal relative position, it'll give you a condyl position, and the discluding factor of the protrusive pathway. And then of course mounted study casts on a curved path articulator for more accurate jaw simulation. Our benefits and features is that we're user friendly, we have simplicity in our design. We create time saving procedures. It's based on science and research. It is compatible with all specialties and disciplines. Uh, we can uh, communicate with the laboratory for both function and aesthetics. We got great educational support. Visit our website. I have all our instruction manuals there. I've created a lot of videos, presentation and demonstration videos you may not have seen, so go check those out. You can see those from our videos button on our website or the Panadent channel on YouTube. And all this creates a cost effectiveness. I don't care how creative or innovative a product may be, if you can't get customer support, then it's a useless piece of equipment. You know, I often ask Dennis, how many of you put in a fee for redos and remakes? You know, and they don't raise their hand usually. Do you ever have to do redo or remake anything? Sometimes. You have to realize that at that point in time, you're starting to lose money. So the more effective you can be in communicating with the laboratory for both function and aesthetics to get more predictable results, it is cost effective. Our mission at Pan is we're dedicated to providing quality in products, exceptional customer service, and we're actually celebrating our 40th year this year uh, to the dental profession. Please join me at my next webinar, July 18th. It's going to be tools, tips, and tricks for aesthetic dentistry and uh, how to apply the articulator uh, to achieve optimum aesthetics as well. I'd like to leave you with this uh, little saying by uh, Bill Murray. He says, believe